Hello there, AP Calculus AB students. Mr. Record here, taking a look at our second and final example that comes from Topic 5.5 out of the AP Calculus course and exam description. And we're still talking about this idea of using the candidates test and finding absolute extrema. But in this particular problem, we're also going to invoke the idea of particle motion, something that we've talked about here uh, really over the past couple of units. And, and it's great to see these calculus concepts merge together because it's so indicative of what would happen on your advanced placement calc exam that you're going to take in May. So why don't we all take a look at our example two here. So it says, finding the minimum maximum velocity and acceleration. So the question reads, a particle moves along a straight line such that s of t is t to the fourth minus 4t cubed plus 6t squared minus 20 for a time increment of 0 to 3. Find, in part a, the minimum and maximum velocity of the particle on the interval from 0 to 3. And then down below in part b, we're asked to find the minimum and maximum acceleration of the particle on the interval 0 to 3. Now, there's a couple of things I want to point out. First of all, the usage of the word minimum and maximum without the adjective. You'll notice that we don't see the adjective relative. We don't see the adjective uh, absolute, global, um, local. None of those adjectives are existing right now in this problem. But if we couple that idea with the fact that we are given a closed interval, then always the assumption is that we're looking for the absolute extrema. That's really important. In other words, a problem is not obligated to use the adjective absolute or global if they provide a closed interval. It's really, really important. So we know that then this is the candidate's test. The next thing I want to point out is the fact that we are going to minimize and maximize the velocity. What that means is that we have to work off of a velocity equation. In other words, we have to find critical numbers for a velocity equation. And that means you might find yourself even having to look at the derivative of that velocity. And that's what's really tricky as well. Let's dive in and take a look at this. First of all, we are given position, and we know that we can find the velocity function by simply taking the derivative of position. And since this is a polynomial problem, this one should not be too terribly challenging, at least to take the derivative. So, boom, there we have it. But this is where we have to understand, I don't want to set this function equal to zero. I don't want critical numbers here. I want to find critical numbers that I can use to, to work with v of t. So we have to take the derivative of v. So you're taking the derivative of the function that you're trying to maximize and minimize. So that derivative here is going to be 12t squared minus 24t plus 12. And, and if you're thinking, oh, is this derivative of the velocity equal to the acceleration? That is exactly right. But you don't really have to think about that yet in part A. Let's let that concept enter the picture when we get down here to part B. And in fact, we've done some of the work for part B already. OK, so we want to figure out when is this velocity prime equal to 0, or possibly when is it undefined? And as I'm finishing writing this undefined, I think we can pretty much pull the plug on him. We're not going to ever have a value where the velocity is undefined, not when it's a polynomial. Now, for the derivative equaling 0, different story. I'm going to go ahead and start by factoring out a 12 because, well, we can. And it's going to make our lives just a little bit easier here. Once I cancel the 12 over to the other side, I believe we see that this factors into t minus 1, t minus 1, or t minus 1 squared. And so we only have the one critical point, the critical value for the derivative of v equaling 0. So if you remember, candidates test, you're going to list who the candidates are. You actually don't have to even write this. I only demonstrate this when I'm teaching. 
but the candidates would be the critical values that you got along with the endpoints, which are 0 to 3. What you do have to do is show that you're going to evaluate those critical points in some kind of a, a table here. And it doesn't matter what order you write them. I'm always going to write them in ascending order, but that doesn't really make any difference. And the key is we are going to test these in V of T. That's the other part that's so important. You want to make sure that those expressions, or those values, I should say, are going to be entered into that V of T. You're looking for what is the highest V, what is the lowest V, and this is the way to go about it. So if you plug 1 in, it's pretty clear you're going to get 4 times 1 cubed minus 12 times 1 squared plus 12 times 1. That is going to give us 4 minus 12 plus 12, which is 4. And I, what am I doing? <laughs> Hold on. I plugged 1 in. Let's drop that down here. Yeah, I'm, I'm making it a lot harder, right? If we plug in 0, we don't have to show much work for that. That's going to be 0. Okay, now we plug in our 1 and we get 4. I gotta, was getting ahead of myself because plugging in the 3 is probably going to be the most challenging part, um, at least from an arithmetic standpoint. So we should be able to handle this. Um, 4 times 27, right? 4 times 27, that would be 108. 12 times 9. Well, if you think about that, 12 times 9, that's also 108, I believe. And then you add 12 times 3, which is 36. It's going to be pretty clear that 36 is going to be that value. So you just simply step back, find out what is your largest value and what is your smallest value. So we could say that the absolute min, I still like to use the adjective absolute min when I write my results. So the absolute min of the velocity is zero, okay? And if you want, you can say it occurs at t equals zero, but you don't need to say that. And then the absolute max of the velocity of this particle as it's traveling along is 36. And you could say again that that occurs at t equal three, but it's not important. Boy, do you really understand now the importance of testing the endpoints, because that is where we found both of these uh, particular results. Okay, let's move down to do part B, and as I said, we've actually done a lion's share of the work with this part B. We're trying to minimize and maximize acceleration, so we really want to work off of the equation referred to as acceleration. Well, if you think back to your part A, you've already done that at this step here. That V prime, which is 12t squared minus 24t plus 12, is indeed your acceleration. So from here, we're going to have to find his derivative, which is just 24t minus 24, and then you're going to have to set this part equal to 0. So here we go, and we'll also set that part undefined, but by the time I've just written this, I've looked and said there's no place where this is going to be equal to 0, or undefined, I should say. Now, as far as equaling 0, different story here, because I'm going to factor out a 24, and it's kind of interesting what happens. I end up getting the same exact critical value. That is just a coincidence. It's not always going to happen, but we'll go ahead and take it. And so the candidates for this particular part are the same. I'm going to be looking at 1, 0, and 3 again. Now you want to make sure that those get placed in your table. Any particular order is fine. I will still go with the numerical order or chronological order since we can think of t as being a time. And the good thing about this is that I think you're going to have a slightly easier time evaluating your um, 
a of t, and oops, I wrote the wrong thing in the table. This would be an a of t because I'm maximizing and minimizing the a. So I'm going to go into this, and like I said, it's just a little bit easier. The exponents are a little bit smaller. So if I plug in a 0, I think we can all see very quickly that you get 12. If I plug in a 1, we, of course, get 12 times 1 squared minus 24 times 1 plus 12. If you take a good look at that, that's going to be 0. And then if we do the same thing with our 3, this is probably the most challenging one, replacing all of the t's with 3. We end up with 12 times 3 squared times 24 times 3 plus 12. So 12 times 3 cubed, 12 times 3 squared minus 24 times 3 plus 12. And I might have to do a little work down here below. 12 times 9, that's our 108 again. 24 times 3, if you have to work that out a little bit off to the side, that's fine. That's going to be a 72. So basically, 108 minus 72, well, I think that's going to be 36. And if I add 12 to that, that's going to be a 48 result. So it looks like I've got my maximum acceleration uh, down at that value of 3 as well. So here we go. Let's write it up. We're going to say absolute min of acceleration. And by the way, you could say absolute um, minimum acceleration, but I thought if we wrote absolute minimum of a of t, it was a little bit more uh, succinct. And the answer would be 48, and that occurs at t equal 3. Absolute max. Um, Let's get this right. The absolute min is 0. That occurs at 1. The absolute max of a of t is 48. you got to concentrate. Boy, if you start like letting your mind wander, yep, a lot of bad things can happen. You can get the word minimum and the word maximum completely uh, reversed here. Now, some students may ask, um, especially after going through some of the particle motion lessons that you've been going through, do you need to put units for any of these? And the answer in this particular case would be no. If the problem comes pretty much dimensionless, unitless, you don't have a distance or a time, it's not important that you make something up. You don't have to say 48 um, units per time per time. There's going to be a time and a place where you're going to really need to label this is not that time or place. So let's take a look at some graphs here. Absolute max V is 36. Max acceleration is 48. The both mins were 0. If I take a look at the graphs, notice my original position equation is what we have here in blue. So this particular particle had some negative position along, say, the x-axis for a while, and then it finally crossed over and was into the positive range. But what I'm more interested in is this black and red graph. The velocity graph here in, in uh, red shows you that we had a minimum value of 0, and the max, well, that's going to be 36. I know you might have to think about using your scale of 5, but that looks to be pretty accurate, about 36. If you look at your acceleration graph, the minimum did occur here at 0, and the maximum did occur up here at 48. So everything seems to have worked really well graphically. Anyway, I hope this helps out. It concludes our 5-5 videos. Be sure to stick around, watch some of our 5-6 as we get into the second derivative analysis and working with concavity and points of inflection. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.